Sure. So welcome. And uh, this week we are going to start with some of the application areas and challenge problems of practical uh, applications of medical image analysis. So we have five different topics which range from ophthalmological image analysis uh, to uh, digital pathology applications and on, on the way we would also be going through radiological uh, imaging and image analysis problems as well. So for the start of it, uh, today's topic is actually to do with ophthalmology and ophthalmology to make it much more simpler is basically imaging of the interior surface of your eye and uh, we are going to look into one very specific uh, challenging problem called as uh, retinal vessel segmentation. So without uh, much of a delay, let us uh, get into what uh, this comes down. So, I have this organized as uh, the motivation and then uh, I would be discussing about the data sets and then a bit of prior art history because this problem has been there uh, for more than 20 years now and what has happened in the last 20 years and then uh, I would specifically discussing more on the recent contributions and more of these contributions are something which comes from our group uh, itself and uh, so we have three different genres of uh, contributions coming down one of them is by understanding the the imaging physics itself and then trying to put down some sort of a machine learning algorithm on top of it in order to enhance understanding of imaging physics and taking down cues from imaging physics to do an image analysis. The next one is a pure data driven approach which makes use of uh, deep neural networks in order to do image analysis from the perspective of doing a vessel segmentation of uh, retinal vessels. And the third one is quite an interesting one which is uh, where we apply this uh, very recent concept of what is called as domain adaptation and uh, we show you as to what a domain is, what we mean by a domain and what is about adapting a domain and, uh, and, and a very curious case where you would see that uh, actually trying to do it via a domain adaptation improves the accuracy with which we can actually segment out vessels. And finally, I would leave you on an end note with uh, a pointer to one of the very fundamental papers on retinal image analysis which uh, you are expected that you go through it so that you have a comprehensive overview of uh, what the field of medical image analysis with respect to retinal images has been till now. So that does not uh, restrict itself only to understanding vessel segmentation, but you have everything over there from vessel segmentation to extru uh, extruded detection to uh, uh, understanding of uh, on fluorescent images as well. So let us start with the motivation and where it comes down. Now the motivation for this is actually to start with uh, fundus imaging, which is uh, primarily used for uh, as, as a screening modality. Now, when you go down to say uh, ophthalmologist uh, for your eye inspection, so often you would have seen that uh, he carries something which looks like a torchlight and then uh, he would be pointing that into your uh, eyes and then through it looking down uh, within the anterior surface of your eye. Now from this whole thing, what he gets down is a image of the interior surface of your eye which is the photosensory layer which is called as the retina and this whole surface together is called as fundus and that is why you get this name which is called as fundus imaging. So you are imaging that fundus over there from there it comes down the name. Now this is a very good indicator for uh, diabetic retinopathy, uh, glaucoma related problems. Then you have age related macular degeneration which is the macula or, or the photosensory surface, the layer between the photosensory surface uh, retina and then the uh, other underlying surfaces is where uh, with aging you would have some sort of a degeneration coming and it starts to get uh, wriggly and uh, curved and you would be having problem with your vision. So from there to uh, your eyes actually have a good uh, early indicators for stroke and hypertensive uh, changes as well which is the reason why uh, image analysis for the retina is now really getting a high uh, push in the community. So these challenges uh, over here are uh, detecting and segmenting vessels phobia optic disc. So we have uh, on the optic disc side you have both localization as well as segmentation of the problem. Uh, then understanding pathology and detecting pathology from your fundus images as well. Uh, the next part is obviously on image quality assessment. So this is about how good is the quality of uh, these retinal images which have been acquired by the ophthalmologist directly. Now uh, from there uh, I would take you down to where is the play field of this one. So one of the most uh, 
popularly used widely employed one is what is called as uh, drive or the uh, digital retinal uh, vessel extraction data set uh, now these uh, ones are available for free use you can just go on to this particular website which is on the pointer over here now what you would see typically is that uh, i have opened up as a gallery but you can always go to the downloads page and then download all the 40 images which come as 20 for training and 20 for testing sets over there now uh, a lot of people who had contributed earlier in terms of prior art, they have uh, put back their results over here and then you have the results browser where you can click on one of these and then uh, it would open up and show you each of these images over there and you can see the accuracy, sensitivity, specificity and area under ROC curve, uh, these values coming down over there. So this is one of the main uh, playgrounds which we use for uh, vessel uh, segmentation. The next playground which we do is what has come up uh, in the recent years is called as STAIR. And uh, the beauty is that while drive is primarily or uh, this previous data set drive, this is primarily from healthy subjects who are not symptomatic of any particular kind of uh, retinal pathology. The STAIR data set is from uh, people who have some sort of a pathology over there and for most of them uh, they do have some sort of a hypertensive disorder or they have uh, diabetic retinopathy problems over there. So these have both healthy uh, subject data as well as disease subject data and, and since we had already discussed about uh, systematic evaluation and validation and I had explained you about the uh, ratio of uh, subjects from different categories and why you should be preserving the priori probability of for each of them. So now you have a very clear understanding as to why we need to have both the symptomatic cases and asymptomatic cases coming down or disease cases and the healthy cases there within our data set in order to evaluate the performance of our algorithm. So this is one uh, I would definitely put down a pointer. The There are a few of the other ones so one of them is direct. Uh, uh, diaret which is a standard diabetic retinopathy data set and there is a db0 and a db1 both of them you can just make use of them they they come down with ground truth annotations as well so you don't need to worry a lot about it then uh, there are high resolution fundus images which are from uh, uh, the University of Erlangen and Germany and uh, these are good in a way because they are full HD uh, scale images which provide you a much better resolution and a much higher granularity than you have for other images which were uh, sort of in a 600, 800 or a 640, 480 resolutions um, uh, image pixel sizes. And then there is another one from the uh, Kingston University in UK which is called as the Chase. So this is one which has come up in the recent years only and uh, you can make use of any of them. They are all free for download. Now, now that you know about uh, all your data sets, the next thing comes down is knowing about what has happened in the past and that brings us to the prior art problems over here. Now uh, vessel detection in this white light fundus imaging and the major necessity is that uh, you have these for the referencing of different pathologies. So whenever a uh, ophthalmologist reports a particular pathological uh, manifestation on the fundus image itself he or she is going to report it with respect to their uh, anatomical locations or landmarks which are often uh, actually uh, denoted with respect to vascular branching or where the vessels are. So that is what acts as a ground referencing. So say as if you want to uh, uh, tell our address in say some sort of a remote village where there are no street names and street numberings or house numberings possible then generally you have a referencing over there so it is at the cross section of so and so road where you have this big banny entry and then you need to look at the second house on the right. So these ophthalmologists would also be using a similar kind of thing because obviously vessels in your eyes are not numbered and all pixel locations over there are also something which is not associated anatomically by a number. So you need to put down these kind of relative referencing in order to come down uh, to uh, reporting out these pathologies. Next is that uh, once we have this detection of uh, vessels done quite effectively, it would reduce significantly a clinician's dependency on the fluorescent angiogram in order to find out how the vessels go. Otherwise the procedure would be that uh, in order to find out the vessel map, I will have to do some sort of a procedure which is called as angiography. That would mean uh, for this particular purpose what clinicians do is they inject a dye which is fluorescing dye. Now as this dye passes on through your blood vessels, they keep on imaging your blood vessels and then they integrate over time. So the dye is going to pass, pass through your blood vessels directly and if I am integrating it over time then what I would get down is basically a map over the regions from where this dye has passed down. Since it is passing through blood vessels, so you get a map of all the blood vessels coming down. The problem is that this dye is generally toxic to our body 
and you would need to flush it out of your body and so people would need to pass down more of urine drink a lot of water so that it, it gets filtered out of your kidney and then flushed out of the blood and uh, generally these kind of imaging is done for people who are diabetic and who have a diabetic retinopathy problem so that you have a vessel map available. Now people who already have diabetes they have a kidney overload already there and you are going to overload them. So this is sort of a quite risky situation on the clinical side as well and uh, having an automated system for detecting vessels on bright white light images would make it much more simpler. Now you till now since we have not seen that many images you would often lead down to this contemplation maybe it is not so complicated that you would have to put down a computation technique over here. But I would come down to those exact problems as to why we have a computational technique because by bare eyes we would often fail to find out those vessels. So once we go down to those images I would be showing you pinpointed spots where that particular ambiguity comes. Now the since it has been over active for the last 20 years so if you can look down that uh, these were the initial uh, contributions which were there and a lot of them basically made use of uh, derivative based operators or filtered out derivatives. So there were Laplacian of Gaussian, Haitian kind of operators which were used over there and on top of that people did rely on texture measures as well in order to find out. But most of it was related around one basic concept that these vessels they are basically what appear as lines over there. So if I have some sort of filter kernels which can emphasize on these line kind of behaviors not necessarily straight lines but some sort of uh, uh, a contour which is going down through the image then I would be able to get down my uh, vessel very easily. Now based on this all of these methods which have been done now we are specifically not going to discuss about each of these methods in detail over here but rather look at what are the recent contributions which have been able to overcome the challenges which were still posed by uh, these particular methods. Now, what I do over here is uh, I have a basic listing of what that means. Now generally all of these methods they are less accurate. So it is below 94 percent. The reason uh, from where this comes down is that what these data set developers had done was they had used two human observers to manually annotate it. Now it takes about one hour of time to manually annotate all the vessels present in one fundus image over there. Now when you take two different observers in order to do that what you would do is in essentiality you can take one of them as a ground truth and the other one is who is getting evaluated and then you can do a inter observer variability study. Now if you look at the accuracy between two observers when being compared. So that is what comes down to 94 percent and all of these methods which you see over there none of them had an accuracy which was rivaling at least 94 percent. So their methods were all lower than that. Now this obviously brings to a point that my computer is not as intelligent as my human so that I can actually bring a computer uh, in order to do this kind of a repetitive task over there. So for a repetitive task also it is not uh, efficient as of now. So that is the reason why these methods cannot be employed in that good way. The other point is that uh, there is a high amount of inter observer variability when compared to these methods. So and then that is about like if, if there is a very low amount of inter observer variability you will have this kappa score basically go down to 1. Uh, so that would mean that there is a high amount of inter observer consistency between them. Whereas when whenever it is this kappa value over here is much lower than 1 then you have a low. So this 0.71 is what is the consistency between two human observers. So that is the benchmark which we need to always break till we are below that methods are not sufficient to go down as automated processes. And the other point is that uh, none of these methods had a performance which was uh, rivaling that of the second human observer and that is why these, these were not that taken into consideration. And from this perspective is where. Uh, I am going to bring to you the recent contributions which have so uh, I have three basic contributions. So the first one is from uh, the learning of statistical mechanics and this is one which we had from uh, ISB 2013 as one of our uh, contributions over there. Now where this goes down is uh, we start with the physics of retinal imaging and how it happens is say typically uh, this is the eye of uh, the person whose eyes are being investigated or what is called as a subject side ok. Now typically for a ophthalmoscope what would happen is there is a light source and the light source uh, goes through this sort of a mirror and irradiates the eye and now you would have some reflected light coming out back from the eye. Now this light has to come back from here and instead of getting reflected over here because then I cannot see anything it has to go and meet down this observers eye over here. 
So I have the observer looking over here through this small pinhole. Now the concept over here is that uh, you have this light source which is irradiating the subject side but does not interfere with the observer's view in any way and you just see the, the observer can just look into what is there within the eye. So this is the basic fundamental operating principle for any kind of an ophthalmoscope which is being used. So including that small handle one uh, which looks like a to torchlight uh, to even surgical uh, ophthalmoscopes as well. Now uh, if we take all of this into consideration, so there are some sort of optics involved over here. So there may be some optical transfer functions associated with this mirror then with the lenses of your own eyes and then aqueous humor and vitreous humor which is present inside over there and so the, the, all of these have to create some sort of a mathematical model coming down. Now instead of this observer's eye, we can put down one single uh, electron electronic sensor over here. A CCD sensor or a CMOS sensor and then I will have to look into the response of that CMOS sensor. Now looking into that perspective what would come down is uh, this sort of an equation and let us look into what the uh, different aspects of this one would be. So this R is a contribution which is called as the spatially varying reflectance pattern of the retina or what is created over here. So this is about like given I have a light of wavelength lambda and uh, it is spread in a location of x comma y. So there can be homo in homogeneity in the reflect in, in the incident light or the reflection pattern. Then it is going to have a response created by this. Now uh, the light which is incident over there that is also a spatially varying commodity and that also has a contribution of the wavelength lambda and it varies along x and y. So that is called as x uh, that is called by L over here. Now this whole thing is what will have just a multiplicative nature over there because one pixel to one pixel is the nature. Now along with that there would be a uh, point spread function of this ophthalmoscope optics over here and that would in a sense mean a convolution of this PSF function with this whatever is coming back from the subject side. And uh, so we have this convolving operator which does does a convolution and this is what comes up. The next part is that there this, this ophthalmoscope over here will also have some sort of a spectral transmission pattern or what is called as a spectral filtering approaches over there. So it will allow certain wavelengths to go and it will stop certain wavelengths over there or, or it can have a different uh, kind of uh, amplification factors for different wavelengths. So for some wavelengths it will mm, do a all pass for certain wavelengths it will restrict it to say 50 percent for some to 70 percent and it will allow it to go. So together this is what will give me the model of what is called as BXY lambda which is the total response being received at the sensor electronic sensor placed over here. Now uh, from there let us go it down into the understanding about what happens at the digital readout when we have on an electronic sensor. So say we have a sensor which has a Bayer pattern and uh, let us consider a standard uh, Bayer pattern over here and as in this checker matrix. Now you would have some sort of a current which is being read out at this particular at any pixel location and that is called as a D. Now that will have some constituents of uh, noises as well and these noises will be the dark current noise, there will be short noise, there will be readout noise and for much more details you can actually refer to some uh, electronic sensing books which will have much uh, clarity on this one. So this, this would what will come down as a very basic model of uh, photon to electron pair generation and then digital readout sensing from an electronic sensor. Now, on this kind of a system apart from the noises you would have a external quantum efficiency of the sensor. Uh, then there would be a term which will be the rate of photon induced electron generation rho then an integration time t and uh, you would have an amplification factor a and together in any kind of a general operating condition what would happen is that these noises would be much lesser than k rho t over here which is uh, the rate at which photons are being generated and then your distribution of this current uh, this, this readout voltage D over here will be what will be guided by the distribution of this K rho T and we need to understand that part. Now in order to understand that part what will happen is that generally if uh, rho is the rate at which these photons are incident on a sensor and T dashed is say the integration the total integration time uh, of the sensor then this distribution model say f of the digital readout data d is what is proportional to what we have over here and if you inspect this one. So this is what looks very similar to a uh, Poisson distribution and an additional factor which we have is that this is guided down for when lambda is uh, in the range of lambda 1 to lambda 2 
and that comes down from the factor that we have these sensors over here. So, each is fit down with one specific kind of an optical filter either a green filter or a red filter or a blue filter. Now, they will have some minimum bandwidth minimum wavelength to maximum wavelength which is the range in which they will pass down all photons over there and that is what comes down over here as lambda 1 and lambda 2 specifically. So, with this we know that the distribution of all the photons over here is going to be Poisson. Now, given that it is a Poisson distribution process the main uh, objective over here say that we define a meta variable which is called as t. Then the ob, uh, part which we take over here is that if this is a Poisson distributed process then the expectation or the mean of the variables over there is equal to variance of the variable and that is what we take as one of the cues for solving our problem. Now, from there we can find out a distribution for the red sensor, green sensor and blue sensor independently if we are looking at every channel of the image. Now, that would help us in creating what is called as a multi scale photon density uh, estimation model or what uh, typically happens is since you are solving some sort of an estimator over here in this particular line which is estimating or finding out what is the mean value over there. So, you need to understand whether you are computing mean over 3 samples or you are computing mean over 5 samples or 7 samples. So, if you are looking into a 2D space it can be a 3 cross 3 which on which we can compute out what is the mean it can be 5 cross 5 it can be 7 cross 7. Now, instead of trying to optimize as to which is my best uh, scale at which I can compute I can actually take a whole stack of multiple of these scales and over this pyramid I can compute out what will be my uh, expectation value coming down and that is what we call as the multi scale photon density estimation model for each specific wavelength. Now, from there we enter into what we do for the vessel detection framework. So, here given that you have a training image what you would initially do is you would create this multi scale estimation framework which is as such an unsupervised learning problem. So, you just have an estimator running and, and there is no nothing specific which is uh, which requires a supervised learning over there. Now, from there what we do is on the other side we have ground truth labels available to us which are uh, these all of these white pixels are what denotes the vessels coming down. Now, we can use these parameters. So, say a vector of all those estimations of means and then use some sort of a learning engine. So, this can be a random forest, this can be a, a neural network, this can be uh, say any other thing support vector machines or uh, linear discriminant analysis or a Bayes learner. And then uh, this, this can actually learn to discriminate based on these uh, tissue photon interaction models as to what and where all these pixels which denote a vessel are located. Now, during test what we do is we take a test image and then uh, we again estimate this uh, tissue photon interaction model over there. Now, we can use this train model coming down over here in order to predict out what will be the kind of vessel appearance models coming down. So, this is what typically would be a vessel appearance model which is predicted. Now, from there let us look into what this performance assessment looks like. So, this is uh, what visually the method which I was describing over here looks like and they are these are all the other uh, comparing methods which we have in place. Now, in order to look into a much more uh, intuitive numerical aspect over here. So, I have uh, so this particular method has an average accuracy which is about 0.97. Now, consider this that we are looking at beating down the human observer. So, the observers accuracy. So, these these are methods which are now able to overcome the observers. Uh, so, two humans the amount of disambiguity between them we are above that. So, it means that we are much more consistent than two humans are between them and this is where automation is going to actually help in the whole diagnostic process. So, if you look at the kappa score as well that also indicates the same thing. Now, coming down to a much critical evaluation of the different stages. So, this is what I have over here. Now, if you look over here uh, this is the main image on which this small uh, uh, cyan colored square is where uh, we point down the zone which is magnified and shown over here. Now, if you see on this it is really hard to find out where the vessel is and then since I know where it is. So, it is somewhere over here the ground truth also marks it somewhere over here, but just looking with a naive eye and then there is a high chance that you would miss down where the vessel is located in this particular small region. Whereas, you using these kind of methods you are able to predict it out quite effectively. The other problem is around this uh, optic disc region where uh, you have uh, different layers and overlapping vessels coming down and you can see that it, it gets pretty uh, discreetly predicted. The other challenge which comes down is that the ambient illumination intensity around this optic disc is pretty different for different images and that is this comparison over here. You still have the method doing it down pretty fine. 
Now, if you look at this uh, notch box plot of accuracy is shown over here, one major observation is that while the average accuracy is obviously higher than all the other methods, the consistency is also higher because the spread of the notch box plot is much lower than we have for other methods over there. So, this is what uh, makes this method much more uh, intuitive and easy to use and then where we have a major impact coming. Down. The next one is that uh, once we have already studied about that, the next is about using auto encoders for retinal vessel segmentation and this is one of our papers from EMBC uh, 2015 where what we tried to do was that if you look at the earlier method then uh, it somehow appears like uh, there is some sort of a heuristic uh, juggling going on and uh, out of all of these mathematics you are able to prove it out. Now if we want to do it say using a data driven approach then can we do it and that is the question which we were asking over here. So the idea was pretty simple we thought of creating just a two layer uh, stack denoising auto encoder. So the techniques you have already studied in the earlier lectures over there and the idea was that you have uh, similar kind of patches created over here by random sampling and then you train it with the ground truth such that this neural network can actually predict it down. Now from there uh, what we learnt was something like this. So what we did typically is this is the architecture which we are looking down. So there were two layers of denoising auto encoders and then there was a finally a random forest which was learning all of these uh, layer specific outputs in order to predict out vessels. Now uh, here the auto encoder was used purely from a perspective of uh, uh, discovering features which you can learn down in order to uh, isolate blood vessels. Now what we did is we took some random samples of uh, patches. So these are the kind of patches which you see over here and then these were the kind of weights it had learned on the on the first layer of the auto encoder and these are the kind of weights it was learning on the second layer of the auto encoder. So using all of these uh, what we get down is something a result over here. So not exactly on the same uh, scale of comparison we did not use the same images it was a different group of images which I show you over here. But you can carefully see that even these thin vessels one single pixel thin vessels they also get pretty much easily detected over here. So you can go through the rest of the paper for much more detailed about uh, comparative studies with respect to the accuracy and kappa score and sensitivity specificity. So now this is where I was still speaking about only using one single data set coming down. So that would mean that uh, I have one single hospital where uh, people almost of the same cohort group come down and I have the same ophthalmoscope being used for imaging every single person. Okay. What happens if say suddenly I change my ophthalmoscope. The whole nature of imaging is going to change over there. The resolution of imaging is again going to change over there. Then can I use the same method for doing it without having to retrain it with a new data set. That is where the challenge comes down today. So that is what is addressed in uh, this particular paper which is on domain adaptation for vessel segmentation and curiously at the end of it I will show that why there is a much more powerful implication of uh, using domain adaptation for these kind of problems as well. So, uh, what we start with is say I have this uh, commonly available data set which is my drive data set coming down and then I train down a deep neural network. Okay. So we train down a simple stack denoising auto encoder over here without that random forest thing over there. So this is a fully connected uh, neural network uh, for segmentation. Now from that what I do is say I put down an image from the drive data set I get a very good segmentation coming down. The moment I take a different data set a state data set and do it I have a complete uh, change of my world. The problem over here is that all of these background which is supposed to be black now starts showing up white as the vessel along with these vessels as well. So this is nowhere close to what I was expecting to get down in any way and this is the major challenge which we face over here. So what uh, we can do is something of this sort that say we have these uh, images coming down this is what is called as the source domain and then we train some sort of a classifier which is a classifier which is trained on the source domain. Okay. Now we take down uh, if we have images on testing from the same domain then we get down a good result. But the problem is that the moment we take down a different uh, domain and images on a different domain which is called as a target domain then we do not get any of this. So this is what demystifies what is defined as a source domain and a target domain. So from there the idea is the moment you would like to do an adaptation what we have to do is we have to take image and the ground truth of the target domain and then feed all of this information via some sort of a adaptation algorithm which is again another one level up of a uh, learning algorithm itself into this uh, network 
such that it gets adapted and once it's adapted then you would see that you get perfect results coming down on your segmentations in the target domain as well now uh, on on the notation side of it is uh, what we call as say uh, these are the two classes so maybe these circles are what represents the background and pluses are what represent the vessels over there and any kind of a classification margin uh, is, is basically this line which you can draw in order to segregate them. So, this is what a typical classification problem would be defined as. Now, in the target domain you would have a similar thing domain adaptations may basic definition is that can you invert this uh, separation margin or the classification margin in a way such that it can actually adapt to classify in the target domain as well. Under a constraint the domain adaptation is where it is used most likely in scenarios where you have less number of samples annotated and available in the target domain, but you have a lot of samples available in the source domain. So, th what you do over there is what comes down through your domain adaptation. Now within a stacked auto encoder the basic idea what we do is by incorporating something which is called as a dropout function or uh, what we call as a systematic dropout. So, the modification which comes down over here is something like this in a typical auto encoder what you will have is you have your input layers, you have your hidden layers and then you have your output layers and then you are going to train it such that the input can repl can be replicated as the output over there and that is the basic auto encoding principle. The problem is that if you want to adapt it then what we do is we put down something called a switch layers in between. So, each switch is a binary switch which is connected down to these uh, hidden layers. So, either this switch will allow the response to go down or if it does not allow the response then what comes down over here is 0. So, imagine it, it as a circuit and whether I am going to allow certain current passes uh, through that particular circuit element over there. Now, this is what we have in this paper brought down over here. Now, the way in which it works out is that initially when you train on the source domain you do not have these switches available. When you want to adapt it you will place this extra layer of switches over here and then with the training data uh, on the target domain whichever is available to you, you would be doing a feed forward and looking through what is the intensity of these responses impacting these output over here. So, the those particular responses which do not impact the output over here they are the ones which are not at all related and you can actually switch them off. So, that you have a better reconstruction coming down over here or the ones which are negatively relating you can switch them off. So, that is the basic concept which we have put on this particular paper. Now, as a result what you get is a beautiful performance which we can see over here. Now, let us look into this final one which is the final graph of uh, training the whole algorithm in order to get down these vessel segmentation. Now, this uh, green curve over here is what is uh, the result of the target classifier or basically if I use the limited amount of data which is available on my target domain in order to train discreetly train one single auto encoder based classifier. So, over the epochs this is where it will saturate on the error curve. So, this is a loss axis curve. The red one is where I am going to domain adapt my classifier. So, this is where this is trained on a source domain on, on the drive data set and then it is tested on the stair data set. The blue one which you have over here is uh, the classifier which is trained only on the source domain. So, it is trained only on the drive data set. So, if I am using a classifier which is trained on the drive data set and using it for testing on the drive data set this is the kind of losses I am getting down which is one of the lowest over there because the data set obviously is from a much less heterogeneous population and it is from uh, all healthy people over there. But the moment I try to train a discrete classifier on disease data set I see that the losses are much higher. In fact, the least loss is much above the starting loss over here for healthy people. Now, a uh, in between approach is what is taken down by a domain adapted classifier and what you do is basically you have the classifier initially trained on your source domain which is with the drive data set and then just use those binary switching layers of systematic dropout in between and then retrain it with limited number of samples in stair. So, maybe 2 samples 3 samples just just this number of images and then you would see that its performance is much better than you would do by trying to train a discrete network by using just 2 or 3 samples from stair data set. So, this is where the main beauty of domain adaptation lies. So, you do not need much number of samples on a different domain to do it and now your classifier which you have already trained on a large data set it can be used for different machines. So, from a 
um, software development perspective, if I am changing the hardware, I do not need to recalibrate my system or recalibrate my whole thing. So, it is just one single shot of recalibration on the software and then your software is perfectly fine and working over there. So, with that uh, we come to an end of uh, this practical uh, application area discussion and one pointer which I would give to you is to look into this particular uh, paper on retinal imaging and image analysis which had appeared in uh, IEEE reviews in biomedical engineering and uh, so this was around in the year 2010 if I remember. So, just have a careful look into this paper, the, the, it is a very long paper where uh, you have discussions on how retinal imaging is done, the whole anatomy of retina and then what are the different problems which are solved and, and more than 100 papers which are discussed at length uh, inside which will give you a very foundational overview. Since we have a very short span to discuss, I have just few pointers for you, but you can read a more uh, on details in this particular paper as well. So, with that we come to an end of this lecture and thank you.